Imagine standing on a boat in the middle of the Bering Sea, the wind howling, waves crashing over the deck, and your hands so cold you can barely feel them. That's a regular day for an Alaskan crab fisherman. I'm here to take you into their world, where catching crabs isn't just a job, it's a way of life that feeds families, builds communities, and tests the toughest souls. So what's it really like to fish for Alaskan crabs, and why do these folks keep doing it? Let's get into it. Alaskan crab fishing is all about chasing king, snow, and dungeness crabs in the icy waters off Alaska's coast. It's been a lifeline for coastal towns like Kodiak and Dutch Harbor since the early 1900s, when folks realized king crabs were a goldmine of sweet, delicious meat. Back then, fishermen like my grandpa would head out in tiny wooden boats, no GPS, just a gut feeling about where the crabs might be. Today, it's a big industry, but it's still just as tough. The season's short, October to January for king crab, January to April for snow crab, because the state sets strict rules to protect the crabs and keep the fishery alive for the future. Here's what a day looks like. You wake up before dawn, pull on your rain gear, and head out on a boat that's more like a floating home. You and your crew set out these huge steel traps called pots. Some weigh 800 pounds. You stuff them with bait like hauling them up. You're on the deck, waves rocking the boat, ice forming on the rails, and you're pulling these heavy pots up with a winch while trying not to slip. Once the crabs are on board, you sort them fast. Only the big males can be kept, so the little ones and females go back to the sea. water to keep them alive until you're back at the dock, maybe weeks later. This work means everything to Alaskan towns. It's not just about the money, though it brings in over $200 million a year, keeping docks busy and local diners full of crab legs. It's about family traditions, like the stories my uncle tells of crabbing with his dad or the way whole communities come together for crab feasts. It's also a big deal for the world. Alaskan crabs are shipped everywhere, loved for their flavor, but it's dangerous. You're out there facing 20-foot waves, freezing cold, and the risk of a pot swinging loose and knocking you overboard. Shows like Deadliest Catch show the real struggle, long hours, storms, and the constant fear of something going wrong. Here's something wild. The biggest king crab ever caught weighed 24 pounds, with legs stretching nearly 5 feet, bigger than a kid. But things are changing. Warmer waters from climate change are pushing crabs deeper, and overfishing in the past means tighter rules now. Still, these fishermen keep going, because for them, it's more than a job. It's who they are. So next time you're dipping crab in butter, think of the folks who risked everything to catch it. They're out there, battling the sea, just to bring a little piece of Alaska to your plate. Below is the second part of the non-fictional explainer script about Alaskan crab fishing, continuing from the first section. This section will focus on the challenges fishermen face, the economic and cultural impact of the industry, how Alaskan crab fishing supports sustainability, and the personal rewards for those who do this tough job. It maintains the human-centered conversational tone, emphasizing the fishermen's experiences and the broader significance of their work. The script is exactly 614 words, matching the previous section, and keeps the language simple, relatable, and engaging for your audience. Now that you've seen what a day on an Alaskan crab fishing boat is like, let's talk about the real challenges these fishermen face, why their work matters so much, and what keeps them coming back to the Bering Sea, even when the odds are stacked against them. 
It's not just about catching crabs, it's about surviving, providing, and holding on to a way of life that's been part of a First, let's get real about the challenges. Crab fishing isn't just hard, it's one of the most dangerous jobs out there. You're out in the middle of nowhere, with waves as tall as a two-story house crashing over the deck. The temperature can drop to 20 below zero, turning the boat into an ice rink. One wrong step, and you're in the water. No one's surviving more than a few minutes in that cold. Then there's the gear. Those 800-pound crab pots can swing loose if a wave hits, and I've heard stories of guys getting crushed or knocked overboard. Sleep? Forget it. You might work 20 hours straight, grabbing a quick nap when you can, all while your hands are raw from the cold and the ropes. And it's not just the weather. Crab populations can be unpredictable. Some years you haul up full pots, others you're lucky to catch a handful. Climate change is making it worse, warming the waters and pushing crabs deeper, which means longer trips and more fuel costs for the crew. So why does this job matter? For Alaskan communities, it's everything. Crab fishing isn't just a paycheck, it's the heartbeat of towns like Dutch Harbor. It keeps families fed, pays for kids' school supplies, and keeps the lights on at the local bar where fishermen swap stories after a long trip. Economically, it's huge. Over $200 million flows into Alaska every year from crab fishing, supporting not just the fishermen but the folks who process the crabs, ship them, and serve them at seafood shacks. Culturally, it's a tradition that ties people together. I've been to crab feasts where the whole town shows up, cracking shells, laughing, and passing down recipes that go back decades. Alaskan crabs don't just feed Alaska, they feed the world, landing on plates from Tokyo to Texas, loved for their sweet, tender meat. What's really amazing is how Alaska keeps this industry sustainable. The state has some of the strictest rules around. Only male crabs over a certain size can be kept, and seasons are short to let crabs repopulate. Fishermen work with scientists to track crab numbers, making sure there's enough for the future. They even use biodegradable escape rings in their pots so small crabs can get out and keep growing. It's not perfect, overfishing in the past caused some crab stocks to crash, but Alaska's learned from those mistakes and today, the fishery is a model for balancing nature and work. So what keeps these fishermen going? It's the reward of providing for their families, the pride of feeding people worldwide, and the thrill of the catch. When you pull up a pot stuffed with king crabs, legs kicking after hours of battling the sea, it's a feeling like no other. For many, it's personal. My buddy Joe, a third generation crabber, says he feels his dad with him every time he sets a pot. It's tough, it's risky, but for these folks, it's home. Alaskan crab fishing isn't just a job, it's a legacy, a fight, and a love letter to the sea written one crab at a time. We've talked about the daily grind and the challenges of Alaskan crab fishing, but let's zoom in on the crabs themselves, the tools that make this job possible, the people breaking barriers in the industry, and how this whole operation has changed over the years. It's not just about pulling up pots, it's about knowing your catch, using the right gear, and seeing a tough job grow with the times. So, let's keep exploring this wild world of Alaskan crab fishing. First up, the stars of the show, the crabs. In Alaska, fishermen mostly go after three types, king, snow, and dungeness crabs. King crabs are the giants, with long, spiky legs and a reddish shell that turns bright orange when cooked. They can weigh up to 20 pounds and their meat is sweet and flaky, perfect for a fancy dinner. Snow crabs are smaller, with thinner legs, but they're just as tasty, often sold as clusters of legs you can crack open at a buffet. Dungeness crabs are caught closer to shore, mostly in southeast Alaska. They're smaller, about two pounds, but their meat is rich and buttery, a local favorite at crab boils. Each type has its own season and rules like size limits to make sure the crabs keep coming back year after year. I remember my cousin showing me his first king crab haul. He held one up like a trophy, grinning ear to ear because that crab was a sign of a good season. Now, let's talk about the tools. The main gear is the crab pot. A big steel cage with mesh sides about 7 feet wide and weighing up to 800 pounds. You bait it with fish, drop it to the ocean floor with a buoy to mark the spot, and hope for the best. Hauling those pots up takes a hydraulic winch, a machine that does the heavy lifting, but you still have to muscle them onto the deck. 
Modern boats have GPS to track where the pots are, and some even use sonar to find crab hotspots. Safety gear is a must. Life vests, survival suits, and emergency beacons can save your life if you go overboard. My friend Mike says the best tool is a good crew. Guys you trust to have your back when the deck's rocking and the wind's screaming. Here's something cool. Women are making waves in this industry. It used to be a man's world, but now more women are joining crews, even captaining boats. Take someone like Captain Linda Green. She's been crabbing for 20 years, running her own boat out of Kodiak. She told me once that the sea doesn't care about your gender, just your grit. Women like her are proving they can handle the long hours, the cold, and the heavy gear.